everybody to the meeting. Uh, just run through the housekeeping to kick off. We're not expecting a fire practice, so if the alarm sounds can all present, leave the building as quickly as possible by the nearest exit. Designated assembly point is the public square in front of CAS beyond the fountain, away from the civic office. If anybody's got mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. No roll call will be undertaken. Can make sure that everybody's either got their phones on silent or switched off. This meeting will be audio-visually recorded and will be available to view on the Council's website and YouTube channel. So all those present, use your microphones to make sure that the audio is captured. Any members of the public entering the Council Chamber are accepting that their images will be retained and broadcast by the Council. I um, don't think there are any members of the public in attendance, but uh, if you are intending to record or film any of today's meeting, please ensure it doesn't disturb the conduct of the meeting and you're requested to only focus on recording. Please note that we need, still need to observe COVID safety protocols, as shown by at least one councillor who's absent today. Officers are free to leave the meeting once their item has been concluded. Can I ask that you sanitise your desks and microphones and consoles, and this will enable other people who are attending to use your seats. You don't need to wear a mask while seated, however, make sure you wear one when you're moving around the chamber. Okay, so if we now actually move on to the agenda, first of all, apologies for absence. Um, I do know that we've got uh, apologies from Councillor Gemma Cobby, Councillor Leanne Hempshaw, and Councillor Majid Khan is not, not here. Okay, I do know he's got a, a back issue, so he might not make it. Um, can I actually ask uh, just everybody at this stage to introduce themselves, who is here for the, for the camera? Um, Martin, if we start up there. Yes, Martin Greenhouse, Tickle and Waddath Ward. <coughs> Nigel Canning, Tickle and Waddath Ward. Councillor Andrew Robinson, Portfolio Holder for Adult Social Care. Uh, Councillor Sarah Smith, Adwick and Carcraft, but also Chair of Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny. Councillor John Healy for Bowlby South. Vice Chair of OSMC. Councillor Jane Kidd, Wheaton Hills of Intake, Chair of OSMC. Yeah, your microphone. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, Caroline Martin, Governance Support for this meeting. Hi, uh, Lee Tillman, Assistant Director, Policy, Insight and Change. Rihanna Nelson, Director of Learning Skills and Opportunities and Statutory DCS. Phil Holmes, Director of Adults Health and Wellbeing and DAS. Uh, Dan Swain, Director of Economy and Environment. Antoinette, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, Antoinette Drinkill, um, representing the Anglican Diocese of Sheffield. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll consider the extent to which any of which public and press are to be excluded and there are no issues on the agenda. Does anybody have any declarations of interest? Okay. Uh, any, we haven't got any members of the public to make a statement, have we? No. Okay. Uh, so quickly move on to the main items on the agenda, which is the DMBC Quarter 3 Finance and Performance Improvement Report. Um, we've got a, a set of questions, but can I ask... Uh, Lee, just to get in, in lieu of Debbie today, to give us a bit of an overview. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to say a few, I suppose, a few things by way of context and a quick whistle-stop tour of some of the highlights uh, in, in the report. I suppose the first thing to say is the context for quarter three that we were operating in was, was a very challenging one. Uh, we obviously saw the uh, Omicron wave hit us uh, towards the end of the quarter. That had a significant uh, impact, particularly in terms of uh, absences uh, and abstraction rates across uh, across the system. Uh, we also saw the, I suppose, the increase in impact of a cost of living crisis that's only been uh, exacerbated since uh, since the end of quarter three, and as we're seeing now and almost every day. Uh, and also, as we came out of the previous waves of, of COVID, that kind of labour market tightness, those challenges in the labour market that were affecting all organisations and, and businesses to different extents. 
So that's the context that we're operating in, and it's always useful to sort of bear that in mind and that before we sort of talk about some of the specifics in terms of our performance. Um, that said, however, I think overall the performance, both financially and across the range of uh, performance areas, was was generally good. Uh, so in terms of our financial uh, position, despite sort of challenging circumstances uh, and uncertainty about longer term finances, you know we we're projecting a break-even position for the current financial year. That was the end of quarter three position. Um, and the use of kind of one-off monies and, and underspends was off, is, is the kind of way that we've been trying to manage some of those uh, difficulties and challenges. So financially, you know, feels, feels like we're in a, in a good, good place. And then performance-wise, you know, some, some challenges definitely, you know, some of which driven by COVID and the impacts of COVID um, and, and its wider uh, effects. Uh, but overall, generally good good performance across across the board. I suppose just to pick out a couple of key points, and obviously colleagues will, will, will pick some of this up as we go later through the agenda. So in terms of clean, cleaner, greener, sort of fly tipping performance, 95% of cases closed within time frames. Um, recycling rates down uh, compared to the same period last year. However, significant progress on tree planting and expansion of the EV fleet in the council. Uh, in terms of prosperous and connected, good performance on planning applications, investment levels, and the council has been successful in securing additional resources into Doncaster. Generally, good performance on housing delivery. In terms of safe and resilient, um, increased referrals into the domestic abuse uh, hub compared to the same period last year. Um, skilled and creative continue to outperform national averages in, with relation to free entitlement to childcare take up and fixed term exclusions and reduction in persistent absences showing, uh, showing improvement too. From a healthy and compassionate point of view, um, rough sleeper numbers reduced uh, in this quarter uh, and some challenges around assessment and timescales uh, as well. In terms of the connected council, which is obviously the, probably the main area that Debbie would probably usually talk, talk, talk through, and the continued emphasis with all those challenges that I mentioned earlier around supporting staff health and wellbeing uh, which is a, is a big challenge and a big emphasis uh, for, for us. In terms of sickness rates, they are up per FTE quarter on quarter. Um, and may, maybe get into that sort of shortly, that 11.4 days per FTE against a target of 8.25 days. I think the rate of increase has slowed compared to previous quarters, but uh, quarter three is usually, and into quarter four is usually one of the main significant challenges. Uh, also challenges around our housing benefit claim uh, the amount of time it takes to pr to progress and process a claim uh, up against target there are reasons significant reasons and mitigations for that which i, I can maybe talk around uh, later um, and also council tax support claim the processing times for those is higher than target but again there's a number of pressures uh, within the team in terms of the other things that they're having to do in terms of processing grants and various uh, asks that are being made of us from from central government so that's just a quick uh, whistle stop tour, if that's okay, uh, Councillor Kidd. Thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Smith, I know you've got a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Lee, for that. Um, you mentioned the steep uh, increase in COVID cases linked to the Omicron variant, both nationally and locally, uh, in the later part of quarter three. Um, can you expand on what the impacts of this has been, please? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and it's been, a, I think, a constant challenge for us as we've gone through the various waves um, of, of COVID over the last couple of years. The way that we're managing that or have been managing that as a partnership is through the Tactical Coordination Group, which brings all the different agencies uh, across uh, Team Doncaster together to kind of manage risks uh, and in the implications of those risks and any impacts that we see of, of COVID. And that, that continued and was, I suppose, enhanced through the Omicron wave just to make sure that we were we were had a tight grip really on, on what was happening and the mitigations. In terms of some of the specific issues mentioned around staff sickness uh, was, was a key challenge, not just in the council, but across the whole Team Doncaster partnership in particular, uh, particular areas, particularly in the health system, that was a, the main uh, significant challenge. And also, I suppose, the impact, the ongoing impact in terms of business as usual activity, because uh, obviously not only were we trying to respond to the uh, impacts of COVID, uh, we we're also trying to make sure that all services were run uh, as well. So that was a, a big challenge. 
and I would say some of the, some of the things that we plan to do as a as an organisation in partnership through quarter three and into quarter four, there was delays in that. So some of the key milestones or projects that we were wanting to progress, we, we had to shift our emphasis and our resources into uh, some extent into the response um, rather than what working on some more of that developmental activity. And then also, as mentioned, there's some of the broader challenges. I think specifically around the business businesses um, in terms of their ability to trade, obviously through uh, through COVID, um, and also those challenges around um, staff absence and re- attraction and retention, because there was multiple things that we were experiencing, not only a Omicron wave, but also some of the impacts of coming out of previous waves and business business reopening. So quite a number of, I suppose, concurrent challenges. I suppose just specifically about the council and its sickness rate. Uh, the figures, as I mentioned, for the quarter were 11.4 days per FTE, um, which is a, an increase of 0.94 days from, from quarter two. Um, as I say, the, ra- the rate of increase is, is slower uh, than in the previous quarter, but there's still obviously a way to go from our, to, to achieve our targets. And I think uh, colleagues in uh, NHR have reported uh, an increase in the number of viral infection, not just COVID, but non-COVID related as well, which was consistent with the time of year um, as well and that, that rise in transmission uh, transmission rates as well and there is quite a lot of detailed data about the breakdown of, of those and our colleagues in, um, in in HR work closely with the business areas in terms of some of the uh, things that we need to put in place to support people to come back into work uh, and support their sort of overall well-being. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, I, one of the questions, one of the comments you made was about the rising costs of the uh, living costs across the borough and what is going to be done to address this. Yeah, sure. It's a really, really great question, and and obviously this is getting more challenging as we as we go through uh, this quarter and, and probably continue at least for the rest of the year. I suppose there's two things to say. Um, one around what what are we doing um, sort of more broadly as a partnership. Um, I suppose there's a, there's a range of activity across uh, Team Doncaster, and, and we're, we're looking at this through a number of different, I suppose, lenses. One is how can we mitigate some of the impacts of poverty, but also help to prov- secondly help to provide some of those routes out of poverty for and support our communities and residents to do that. And we've had um, uh, there's a group that's been um, convened by Debbie as part of Team Doncaster to look at look at this and make sure that we're coordinating our, coordinating our efforts as much as possible. And there's a range of things that are in that, in that mix, including sort of financial inclusion. So how do we better improve and coordinate the advice that we that we have? And we we did a big push through the comms across the council and Team Doncaster around, around Money Advice Week towards the end of last year, as a, in quarter three, as an example, working with the Money Advice service uh, nationally and making sure some of our information and material is as up to date as possible so it's easy to access the support and advice and also invested in things like ed- extra support to citizens advice bureau and making sure that that advice is targeted at, at different parts of the borough also quite a lot around supporting jobs skills and employment and i think a colleague um one of the previous uh, over in scrutiny meetings had a, a, a specific session on this around some of the things that are happening both um, mainstream, but also what we're doing in addition uh, to that as well. So helping uh, communities and individuals access jobs, progress while they're in jobs and, and, and get to higher wage, uh, higher skilled employment. And also the other angles that we're working at through that group is uh, access to food and, and also housing support. And I'm aware there's a report due to come, I think through to OSMC probably in the next month or so about that poverty work in the form of a bit of a statement to sort of say this is where we are as a partnership this is what some of the data tells us and then this is what we're doing uh, over the next 12 months as well as what have we done over the last 12 months so it's it's a challenge but it is a big challenge and something we're going to need to keep uh, keep a, a, an eye on and eff- uh, all our efforts on thank you um obviously there's quite we tackle stuff a lot through one-off grants and um, I was just wondering that there are some access for pots of money is everybody aware of what is available and who will benefit from I know you've talked about some of um, the work that you've been doing about that if you wonder if you could expand a little bit on it thank you yeah sure thank you yeah and and I think it's important to say that there are there have been a number of one-off grants that have been introduced over the last um, sort of couple of years really and and some of that is a, is a choice about that's the, that's the way that the um, 
policy has been devised nationally in terms of these grants come to local authorities to then administer and then support communities to access. There are obviously there are other ways to do that, but that's the way that it's been currently done. So there's a number of schemes that are available um, and have been available to support uh, communities. And I've just got a, got a summary of some of those. And what the, what the first thing to say is there are a number. <laughs> so that is one of the challenges, I think, uh, that, that, we, that we face. So we've got things like the local assistance scheme, which has been increased, which is emergency payments for uh, low-income residents. We've got discretionary housing payments, uh, which are top-ups for housing benefit and, and universal credit claimants. There has been test and trace self-isolation payments. They've now ended. Uh, they ended at the end of February. And then we've got the household support fund, uh, which is also due to end at the end of March. So a lot, a lot of emphasis on the local assistance scheme going forward. And then there are other schemes and, and I'm sure members are aware of, of these but I'll just um, sort of summarise some of them that will be shortly becoming available. So there's the council tax energy rebate that was announced um, a couple of months ago by government and that'll be £150 for everyone in uh, council tax bands A to D and that's been processed uh, from April and so the 130,000 households will have access to that in Doncaster. And the council's allocated uh, 725,000 for council tax discretionary rebate scheme. Uh, and also there's in the spring statement last week, a further top up for the household support, support fund scheme, um, which we've been allocated as the DMBC have been allocated an extra 2.98 million uh, as well to support low income households with food and energy costs. So I suppose the first thing to say is that there's, there's a fair bit out there, but it, it does tend to come in, there's different sort of funding pots and, the, and I think that's that's a challenge. But what colleagues are, are doing um, their, their best to do is make sure these are communicated um, through as many channels as we can, making sure that information's getting out there, frequently asked questions on the website, uh, use of social media, the direct emails that go out uh, to everyone that we have email addresses for as a, as a council, which is I think about 100,000 emails uh, as well. Uh, and also supporting people with their awareness through council tax bills. So I'm not saying that's perfect, but it, it, the challenge is the complexity of the, and the breadth of funding streams, but then making sure that that's available and, and accessible as, as possible. Again, it's something that needs to be kept uh, an eye on, I think, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we, we are going to be looking more in detail at poverty, and um, you probably... Um, I, described what we were all fearing to some extent that the complexity of what, of what, what is available is actually a, a barrier for people accessing it and that might be one of the things that we look at in more detail when we do look at the tackling poverty issue. Um, I've got a question around value for money with staff and agency staff in particular and we've got um, sort of Councillor Robinson here and I've noticed the the deputy mayor's come in as well so if you want to contribute at all to this we are putting a bit more emphasis today on adult social care so we'll move on to that later but if at this bit really sort of tell me about how we are getting value for money as far as possible from the agency staff that we do have to use and also sort of talk me for how we're progressing with making sure we've got permanent staff in the right roles and also about future planning around the council's workforce whether it's at um apprentice level or, or, or you know higher up the level where we've got shortages in expertise uh, and I don't know who wants to kick off with that one. Shall I, I'll kick, kick off if it's okay maybe just a yeah, bit of a course, general yeah. overview of some Absolutely. of the things in place and then I know Phil and, and Rihanna and other colleagues might want to come in. I suppose just in terms of the workforce planning uh, generally it, workforce planning is a key part of the council's performance management framework and we've got a number of kind of mechanisms by which that work is progressed. So it's a key part of service planning that, that obviously all parts of the organisation do, workforce planning and a workforce strategy that underpins it is, is, is key. And there are a number of um, strands really that we have to support that recruitment of uh, permanent staff. So we have uh, and bringing new sort of talent into the, uh, the organisation. So we've got a graduate programme, a very, very successful <laughs> commitment uh, to that. Uh, apprenticeships, uh, which we, we ever increasing, and at the last budget, as I'm sure colleagues are aware, there's an extra investment into um, into apprenticeships, particularly for those hard to fill areas. An extra seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year. Uh, our apprenticeship program is good, and, and obviously there's scope for it, further expansion with that resource. We've got work experience uh, as routes as well, and other um, upskilling of existing staff 
uh, through and there's a PDR conversation every year for all staff around what skills are required to improve uh, their um, their skills for the roles. In addition, some very specific um, targeted campaigns uh, for particular sectors and social care is, is one where there's been the Social Care Academy campaign that's happened. And also there are, there are flexibility where we have, or there is flexibility where we have particularly hard to fill roles where we can look at other, other packages um, to support. So market supplements and, and other things to bring, um, bring a talent in. Overall, and this is the data. The data tells us that we do have very, very specific, hard to fill roles, and we, we you know we'll talk, we've talked about some of those already, and will do. Overall, our turnover, staff turnover, is still relatively low as an organisation when you look at it overall. That's not to say that there aren't major challenges in certain areas, but overall, the turnover is low. So, Phil, I don't know if in Rihanna, if you want to come in on some of the specifics around the health and social care. Yeah, I can just pick up from a from an adult social care perspective, seeing is the chair kind of geared, um, focused on adult social care. So, and we've got, I suppose when I first got to Doncaster back in July 2019, there was quite a lot of agency use, that, that, um, a, lot, a lot of which we weeded out, um, especially consultancy use. So we haven't got any consultants in, in adult social care at the moment. Um, and, but we, we had a kind of a legacy of issues in social work and mm. occupational therapy in particular. Um, the pandemic and the backlog of kind of demand from the pandemic has caused us to increase our agency use around social work and occupational therapy because um, I guess it was a lesser evil than leaving people waiting even longer than they have been waiting for support. So um, there's a set of, the, of, of, of kind of roles, I guess, in, in those adult social care positions that are filled by agency at the moment some of which are kind of supernumerary to help us get through that backlog. Um, but we've, we've done it in the past in terms of reducing agency use and we'll do it again. I think what we haven't had, being brutally honest, until recently is really strong professional leadership around the social work um, profession and adult social care and around the OT profession. So we've got a new principal social worker who... Um, um, who um, started at the back end of last year. I think if we look at our social work recruitment, we're not making the most of apprenticeships. We're not maximising the number of students that we could bring into Doncaster. When we do bring students into Doncaster, we're not timing our internal recruitment so that really good students continue their careers in Doncaster. Um, these are things that that other places are doing. So there's a set of there's a set of internal things that I think we can improve around, and um, probably social work in particular. What we found in occupational therapy is that um, we've had some really successful recruitment rounds. We've just had one when we've um, when we kind of targeted our communication and our kind of marketing and our identity of Doncaster as a good place to work. The trouble with it is it's very attritional. So as soon as a few people leave, just naturally, we're kind of back in a difficult position again. So I wouldn't buy into the idea that it's just impossible to recruit OTs or impossible to recruit social workers. I think there's more that we can be doing to be a bit more focused in those places. And as Lee said, there are there's an approach to supplements. So we, we've just gone out for our safeguarding manager post and employed a um, a market supplement there because our previous rounds were unsuccessful and we, we needed to be more competitive. But I think most of this isn't about money. Most of it is about just more intelligent approaches, I think, to being clear about what we're about and also working with, with students and apprenticeships who are our future. And actually, we've, had some, we've got some brilliant examples of newly qualified people who are kind of leading the way in terms of development of our practice. So it's just making sure we build on that a bit more. Thank you, Mila, do you want to? Yeah, so don't know if there's a specific question around children's social work recruitment. However, I'm happy to take or to give you a brief overdate of where we are with that. So as you know, all of our social workers are within the Children's Trust um, and they will be transitioning over to the council from the 1st of April. Um, I know that our agency rate um, is coming down within the Children's Trust, but it's like a perfect storm 
as Phil is describing. So demand is going up significantly or has gone up significantly during COVID. And what we then see is spikes in caseloads for social workers. And therefore, we can't have high caseloads because that's not safe for children. And therefore, we have to recruit an agency. We are also competing with our neighboring authorities. So we're all fishing in the same pond. And actually, um, we are competing with pay rates and grades and recruitment tactics, et cetera. Um, and we are working out, I'm working really hard to try and get a memorandum of understanding across the Yorkshire and Humber uh, DCS collective so that we can, we can manage agency pay rates, et cetera, but also social work um, recruitment. So just broadly to t tell you a little bit more in detail. So we've got 40 agency workers at the minute. The majority of them are within our assessment service and that's where we're seeing our high, high demand um, in terms of caseloads. 23 of those are actually uh, co um, covering vacancies at the minute. The other 17 is to is supernumerary, as Phil has described, to cover demand um, and maternity leave and things like that. We have we, our agency rate has been quite stable actually over the 12 over the last 12 months, but we have seen a slight reduction in the last two months. But I wouldn't say that we are on the trajectory to to um, to reduce that because because of the demand and because of the issues that we are facing. I also know that we have recruited more social workers in the last month on a permanent basis than actually permanent social workers leaving. But it's a very small cohort and a very small amount. What I would say in terms of recruitment, we're trying to grow our own. We've got a social work academy within the Children's Trust. And for the last three quarters, we've re recruited social workers or um, newly qualified social workers. And for that, in terms of that package, what that looks like is they've got reduced caseloads, they've got enhanced supervision, they've got better peer support, et cetera, to really settle them in before we, we start um, ramping up kind of the, the, the capacity or the, um, the use of their capacity. And um, what I would say is we have recruited 18 uh, newly qualified social workers through that scheme and we have retained 17. So the first cohort is now kind of our permanent cohort of social workers and picking up more cases. So we are trying to grow our own, we're trying to, and we've, of course we've got the big recruitment drives that we always have around social workers and, and trying to attract people to come and work within Doncaster. Um, so that's where we are, happy to take any questions. Can you just tell me about the retention rates of newly qualified social workers? Um, how do we have a good retention rate? So more recently better because of the Social Work Academy. So our retention rates, so we've recruited 18 over the last three quarters and we've kept 17. Um, I don't have, unfortunately, Council Kid, I can get you the information, the retention rates for other newly qualified social workers that started prior to, um, to, uh, to April of last year. So I can get that for you, but most recently far better because we've got the Social Work Academy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Robinson, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Um, thank you. Um, what I would like to add is that um, on many occasions I have uh, talked to Phil uh, about this issue, um, mm -hmm. recalling the, the preceding um, mayoral term when I was part of OSMC and, and how often we would in this chamber um, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of agency staff um, and I have on many occasions been assured that uh, what we are doing is essential to meet the needs of people in Doncaster and avoid very very long waits for, for assessments that, that just absolutely nobody wants to see. Um, we are all, um, sorry we are of course, I don't know what's causing is it the laptop? Yeah, we're all conscious and, and, and you know, Phil and I have discussed this, that we don't want our staff to be in a position where the colleague next to them is doing exactly the same job but employed by an agency and paid more. Um, but this is, um, as, as, as Rihanna really described quite well for us, it's a national problem and that's why it's so welcome that as a council, Rihanna's doing that task of getting that memorandum of understanding in place because we're never going to solve this completely until we do get to that point. 
Um, I think the other aspect perhaps that's not been said that you know concerns us about the use of agency staff it's that continuity uh, for the members of our community who form a relationship with the person who comes in to help them um, and if that person's from an agency then you know quite possibly they will just disappear almost overnight and you don't get that handover of cases so that's that's something else that's factored into the, you know, to the consideration of things. But I've also um, had scenarios presented to me when it's been said, um, you know, you get um, an ODR to sign off, and it's contained within there that you know we're, we're bringing people in to complete a piece of work. Um, but that's the nature of the sort of funding that's coming in from government. That if you're going to access it and um, use it for the benefit of, of our communities, you've got to move so quickly that you've literally got no alternative. Because if you don't, you won't be able to have the money and the, the community won't get the benefit. So I suppose what I'm saying now, I've kind of moved from being a, a, you know, a chair of a scrutiny panel to being a portfolio holder. Um, I've, seen, I've, seen, I've seen a fuller picture, but I just want to assure you that as portfolio holder, we, we do raise the questions, we are probing it, and, and it's not forgotten about. Thank you very much for that answer. Councillor Smith, you've got a question? It's more of a, a comment, really. Um, Phil, I, uh, I, I lecture at Sheffield Hallam University. I do it in fine art, but I also do it in health and wellbeing, and I teach uh, occupational therapy students. So it'd be brilliant, because one of the things is that we're diversifying our placements across a whole myriad of uh, different things from um, sports for confidence to uh, more creative things. So it'd be brilliant to maybe uh, talk about this, because um, I just think there's a really fantastic opportunity to, to get that. If a student loves a placement, that's it. That's where they want to go. So. I'd be really happy to pick up on that and got our principal occupational therapist in terms of pushing those connections with local universities and our principal social worker and the kind of teaching partnership connections, they're massively important and I think we, we need a clearer profile in those spaces than we've currently got. So using your connection there, Councillor Smith, will be really valuable. Thank you very much. Oh, Antoinette. Just a quick question, really, because if the Social Work Academy is working so well, and it sounds like it is, and it's a real success, could something not like that be um, you know, supported graduate scheme, graduate programme, supported fees for areas within health, like OT or physio, or I mean, speech and language is always an issue. Could that not be supported by the council? And then you might have you know, a pull on the students that you supported to, or a written contract that says, you know, we'll support your fees, and you can might be an A question, but you will stay for so many years. Yeah, it's a good idea. And I think the, the, the NHS connections are massively important as well. And, and workforce in the NHS is kind of always, always the bridesmaid and never the bride. So it gets spoken about a lot. And there are lots of, there's lots of kind of angst about workforce, but, and probably people will say that the integrated um, care system, um, kind of system coming in can add a bit of oomph to that. But we need some career pathways and some Doncaster approaches that feel like they they connect up health and care. Um, they give people pathways between the two of them, and so on and so forth. But I think and I think there needs to be quite a lot of extra oomph to make that happen, um, and it needs to feel more mainstream. I think to a lot of our organisations. I mean, workforce people are really important, kind of workforce leads, but actually it also needs kind of senior executive sponsorship from our health and, and care organisations, including the council, to make it feel like it's got some legs. And then on a really broad, um, from a really broad, taking it right, um, much broader within the council. So I chair a group that is particularly um, charged, and it's the University City Group, Lou where we actually look at the centres of excellence within the borough. So what are the things that we absolutely want to grow the economy in? And one of those areas are health and social care. So we are actually working around pathways from school into college, into university or wherever, or actually um, addressing opportunities for people to actually access um, from any point on that pathway into any formal education or accreditation so that we can build our health and social care. And that's much broader, isn't it? It's from 
the day nursery right into qualified social workers or nurses. So we are doing that. And there's also a really interesting um, scheme around the foundation school for, for nursing or for the NHS that's um, partnered with Hall Cross and the RDA, no, not RDA, uh, DVHT is actually working with the um, with Hall Cross School in growing um, interest and helping uh, young people accessing those pathways. So we are looking at it from a more much broader angle as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we'll just move back to the last couple of questions specifically around Connected Council. Uh, Councillor Healy, you've got a question. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, oh, right, uh, looking at the report, um, I noticed that performance uh, against the average number of days to process a new housing benefit claim continues to remain off target. Um, uh, uh, for quarter three. Uh, the question is, what is being done to address this? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so some of this relates back to the, uh, the answer I gave uh, uh, earlier. So I think one of the main reasons for the performance not being um, where we want it to be is the extra work that the teams have been having to do to process those grants that we were talking about earlier. So the local assistance scheme, test and trace self-isolation, household support fund, etc and some of the business grants as well so it's the same same pool of people basically who are doing all of that that work um however i think things are uh, improving so towards the end of quarter uh, three the the processing times were reducing and they were getting closer still off target we're getting closer particularly in december some extra resources have been been brought in probably similar to the last conversation that's been uh, difficult to get those extra resources but at least two extra processes have been brought in um, challenged to get more in the current in the current market but those actually that extra capacity plus the end of some of those covid grants that i mentioned earlier will help to get performance back to the level um, that it should be um, and the the aim is to get that back to on target through quarter four um, obviously the announcement last week about some more grant funding is is, is, is obviously going to play into that as well so thank you Thank you. Just very quickly, um, can you tell me, you mentioned projects being delayed. Can you tell me what projects have been delayed? So the, I think there's a few a few things around um, where we just had a delay in terms of uh, the, the timescales that we would have wanted to do them. One, one specific example I would give is the peer review. We were due to do a peer review at the end of March. Um, that, that has now been rescheduled for May. And so we allowed ourselves, because of the impact of Omicron, we sort of said that was probably going to be about a six-week six week period. Um, so that was a, a good example of where um, we, we d uh, developed uh, or added some extra time. Another one is some of the changes that we were making uh, internally in terms of how the council, um, some of the officer meeting system works. We were, we were going to make some changes to how that operates to try and make sure there's good, better integration and connection between uh, different teams uh, and across the organization we moved that back uh, a few a few weeks as well um, to make sure that we were focused rightly focused on the uh, on the on the response uh, as well uh, but as you can see overall performance has been generally maintained in quarter three despite some of those uh, some of those challenges thank you very much and thank you for attending in lieu of debbie today um, we are going to move back to adults' health and well-being, and I know Councillor Smith, it's your relevant um, scrutiny panel. You're going to lead on some questions, but if anybody else wants to come in with additional questions, and um, you know, feel free to choose between you, Phil or Andrea, who is best to respond to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Phil, uh, I'm going to start off with the. Can you talk through what the impacts of the ongoing COVID issues are, when, especially with Omicron variant and us living with COVID going forward? Okay, luckily, I've been briefed by someone who knows more than me about this. So, so um, Dr. Suckling's given me a bit of a briefing in, around kind of COVID specifically. So um, you'll know, look like the rest of the country, we've got still got widespread um, community transmission of, of the variant of Omicron called BA2, because you know that variants develop variants over time, don't they? Um, our rates are lower than the, than the um, 
the south and the southwest where there's probably some more difficult scenarios emerging but um still a lot of covid in doncaster's communities people symptoms feel a bit different so people presenting more with kind of runny noses headaches sneezing sore throat sore throat coughs rather than those kind of three classic symptoms we, we, used, to, we used to talk about um relatively high numbers of people in hospital with covid but um only about half of them are kind of going in with covid and there isn't um there isn't a significant impact on the intensive care in the hospital. I think where um, the hospital, like the rest of us actually, probably especially health and care settings are more affected by COVID is in staff absence. So um, current levels of, of kind of escalation in the hospital are kind of, to, as of this morning, they're kind of one below the highest level. They've got four levels, so that they're, they're at three this morning and kind of staff absence around kind of COVID transmission because there will be obviously be more testing going on in health and care settings because for the rest of us, our access to testing is now significantly reduced. So, so that factor in relation to keeping services running while um, there's a higher degree of staff absence is, is, is obviously it will be a, a factor in many um, parts of of kind of Doncaster life, but probably especially in health and care with the higher rates of, of testing that will be happening there. Um, so broadly, um, kind of similar levels of, of issues almost to, to, to January in a, lot of, in a lot of ways. So heightened pressure without, thank heavens, the kind of mortality um, and kind of intensive care issues that we've had with previous um, kind of COVID waves. Um, You'll know that there's more. There's new. There's a new. I've, I've referred to it just now, but there's a new testing regime now. So there are cohorts of people that are able to be tested for free. So people admitted to hospital and people el eligible for um, community COVID nineteen treatment, specifically people who are immunocompromised, and also people working in um, health and care settings in the main. Um, including NHS workers, obviously, um, and um, prisons and places of detention will also get access to, to free testing. Um, you might want to ask about long COVID. I think our overall position on long, long COVID feels relatively unclear. That's almost nationally a sense of um, kind of getting to grips with things. So there's work in the NHS around a, um, around uh, treatment and support for people with long COVID but I think our, our knowledge really of who's most affected and how to best respond to them as a health and care community at the moment I'd say was emerging so that might so my overall take on it um you, I don't know the people listen to Radio 4 this morning but you know a lot of the public health measures nationally have relaxed still talk about wearing masks in public places but probably not many people complying with that um, so overall, kind of, we're kind of. I think we're living with that uncertainty in Doncaster. Thank you. I was just wondering, do you have any plans uh, when we're talking about long COVID? Obviously, because it'll affect some of our staff throughout um, social care and beyond. Uh, do you have any sort of support things within the council for that? I might half look at Lee here, but I'm not sure whether Lee will have had a briefing from HR colleagues. But I don't, I don't think we've got a clear understanding at the moment of who's reported long COVID or whether it's reported, how it's reported. So, so um, overall, in relation to supporting colleagues with long-term conditions and kind of sickness absence issues, clearly we'll be doing that. But I've not seen a specific focus on long COVID in the council. Um, again, I think we need to pull that together alongside health colleagues and understand the implications a bit more. Thank you, Phil. Um, that leads on to kind of a, a discussion we're having a little bit earlier, but expanding a bit further, which is on uh, the workforce labour shortages affecting adult social care. And we were wondering, um, Proud to Care campaign, how successful um, has it been? I would say it was at early stages. So um, what we can describe, um, and we kind of launched our kind of adult social care academy in, in 2020 at the, at the start, around the first wave of the pandemic. 
and the Proud to Care campaign sought to build on that. So we've invested in staffing to run that, the, um, the campaign and the kind of infrastructure behind it. We've agreed an, an induction program with, with uh, worked alongside our care providers to agree a 12 week induction program, which is the, the first tranche of that's been running from, from this month. And we've also done a lot of kind of multimedia work on getting awareness out there. And as we did with, when we first set up the Social Care Academy, Adult Social Care Academy work with business Doncaster in relation to, to those sorts of connections. Uh, February figures are really modest, really modest. So, and, and at the moment, there's a lot of hesitancy amongst kind of care providers. Um, still got people off, uh, as, I, as I just said, affected by COVID in, in the long term. Um, or in the, and in the short term, and still got issues around competition with other markets and, and just around the confidence of the sector. So I, what I'd say is um, it's been the right thing to do to establish the Proud to Camp Care campaign and we will build on it and we'll, we'll improve the, the perceptions and, and visibility of the adult social care sector. But what, what, it's, what it's not doing is bailing us out rapidly of, of, of the difficult situation we've got in relation to um, to um, kind of staffing and, and, and kind of managing demand. So, you know, it's, it, I think we're doing everything we can and we will compare well to other parts of the country in terms of the actions that we're taking. But it's, um, it's not um, a quick fix. Yes, there were um, just, just three points that I wanted to make. One of my uh, roles as portfolio holder has been to sit in on the meetings that are held with with providers and I have to say that I found that a really encouraging experience I think council officers here are really diligent to form the right relationship um, to provide a listening ear to respond proactively and helpfully and and there was um, yeah there was there was just just everything you would want to see in terms of relationship between those providers and our officers in that meeting our training offer is one that we can be proud of um, you know, we have excellent people that are ensuring that training provided to our own staff and also training available within the sector through partnership with Doncaster College, etc., etc., is, is where it needs to be. But for me, the fundamental issue is that we are saying to people, please join the care workforce, come and be valued, do, do an amazing job. But we, what we can't also say is, and your payment rate will reflect the knowledge, the skills, the, the values, the qualities um, that, that you will have and that you will deploy. And, and that for me is, is the difficulty. You drive through Doncaster and you see huge posters up, um, you know, come and work in, in, in retail, come and work in the hospitality sector. And they're, they're offering above the rate of pay that we are able to provide to people working in the care sector. And you know, that really grieves me. And, and I think we are always, as a country, going to struggle and, and, until we can um, ensure that people on the front line of care are paid at a higher rate for the work that they do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and it's a, a brilliant point, which is something um, I've been thinking about a lot is that kind of well-paid uh, work for for care. Um, one another question I have for you, Phil, is how quickly are assessments being undertaken? Uh, the report states that it's a uh, fluctuation in the waiting times for assessment for people referred to uh, within the adult social care over previous uh, quarters. Yeah, so uh, adult social care waiting times. So waiting times for assessments. In other words, I've just for everyone's benefit, I've I need something doing, or I'm I've got a concern. The assessment is broadly someone going through it with me, working out what the issues are, working out what can be done, what can't be done, how it should be done. Um, assessment waiting times in Doncaster issues have been exacerbated by the pandemic, linked to the earlier conversation, but issues are, are, are kind of relatively long-standing as well, and, and needing to be needing to be dealt with. So um, one of the national issues actually is that they, um, they've they dropped, they dropped a, a number of years ago, any sense of national standard around assessment waiting times for adult social care used to be a, a target of 28 days. 
you'd have a target of 28 days to complete the assessment and a target of 28 days to do the follow-up work after the uh, assessment. Um, we are, are the number of assessments that we do a month is relatively stable so it's somewhere between 150 and 180 a little bit of fluctuation we drop like a stone in december because of the absence rates around omicron but generally we fluctuate between 150 and 180. when we look at the length of time it takes to do assessments on average we have to keep half an eye on um you know if, if you finally get around to an assessment that's taken you ages and ages to do it skews the whole average so some of the fluctuations are, are based on long-standing pieces of work finally being completed but typically we're between late 30 days and into the 70s so quite a lot longer than what would previously have been the the kind of industry standard Our, and Lots of work that we've done that probably Councillor Robinson will be able to comment on too around just the experience of people waiting for access. So it probably feeling to, to many people that, that it's not that personable. Um, and actually when we look at our numbers, we almost shuffle people from one list to another. So they'll come in and we'll think, well, waiting for occupational therapy or waiting for social work assessment or, um, or waiting for wellbeing. Our, our wellbeing services is now kind of stepping into that gap, but then it's picking up some, some weights because it's trying to see more people. So an overall experience, I think, where we're, we're probably passing people on to different waiting lists and then the overall process is taking longer. And we've also got an approach that feels a bit centralised. So we, we talk a lot in the council about locality working and using local knowledge to connect people. But a lot of the time our, our work in adult social care has been quite centralised and people who maybe don't know the area that you live in that well are trying to make decisions fairly remotely about, um, about how to support you or how to prioritise you. So what we're doing about that is doing some work in line with our locality working programme, starting in the central locality. Um, we're starting that from, from next month to look at how we can when people turn up to need support in the central locality, how we can bring a whole team around that and how we can reduce the end-to-end -end times. And then we'll start to roll that out. I should say, I mean, when I jump into all that complicated stuff about locality working, what we do do is make sure that people with real life and limb issues um, get prioritised. So we're not, they're not waiting 30 days, 70 days. But it's just that other people, who, the issues will still be important. I'm not trying to trivialise those. They're waiting longer, but people with life and limb issues will be seen more quickly. There's a lot of work to do in this space, I have to say, some of which has been exacerbated by COVID, some of those backlogs. But ultimately, it's probably about fundamentally changing the way we work um, and the way we respond to people in the different communities they live in. Thank you. I'm excited to see how that kind of locality uh, working uh, goes forward um, because it does sound like that might help speed things up a little bit um, for people. Um, I'm just uh, exploring this further. It does say in the headlines that 56% of the people who were assessed or reviewed by adult social care during this quarter received a review of their care between 42 and 365 days after assessment. Um, what What is that review? And, you know, a year is seems quite... A long time. The in, I keep saying industry standard like it's an industry, but the national expectation is that everyone gets a review in a year. That's fairly, and we don't do that. So when you see 56%, 44% aren't getting a review in a year. So that's a problem, isn't it? But the, the overall issue in our services where we've got a lot of firefighting and delay in bureaucracy at our front end of things. So new people coming in waiting when am I going to be seen ringing up some people who are already known to us that maybe we've not kept tabs on as well as we could have done um, therefore there's less time for the service to, to put these I say routine but planned conversations in the diary I agree with you that we shouldn't just be thinking can we tick a box with a once a year conversation some people don't want to be bothered by us to be honest they just want to live their lives but other people will want, they'll need something a bit more responsive than see you in a year. So our overall approach to reviews needs to change too. But until we've got that front end sorted out, till it feels a bit calmer, clearer and better, better 
focused, um, then chasing back end reviews is is is, is a, probably a little bit futile. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, I'm reading the stuff about uh, care homes in here. Um, are there any at risk from going under? Last year, when we um, when we had a, a significant issue about care home vacancies, we did some targeted work with um, with care homes, kind of almost built on data about understanding their kind of their kind of occupancy levels and where they um, you know the kind of journey they've been on with that, but also understanding relative competition around them. So if you've got really high occupancy levels but lots of other care providers around you have got high occupancy levels, you're, you, you're probably going to struggle to fill your beds pretty quickly because they're all going to be competing with you. If you've got um, um, lower occupancy levels and, and, and in, a, in a fewer care homes around you, you're probably going to be find it easier to because people won't have as many places to go to. So we did some targeted work on the back of that and we focused on care homes in parts of the borough that we thought were least well served for care home capacity and if we lost care home capacity that would obviously if in any care home closing is a tragedy for that care home and for the people that live there but especially we were thinking about how any how are each of our areas in Doncaster going to have enough provision going forward and how do we maintain the right sort of balance so and linked to what Councillor Robinson said earlier about maintaining good relationships We've, we've tried to keep up conversations with providers about how they're doing and what they need. <clears throat> I won't sit here and say no care home providers are at risk, partly because sometimes we only know right at the 11th hour because they, 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 they don't necessarily always want to divulge some of the really sharp end things that they're, that, that they're having to deal with. So our job is to be present for them, make sure we're connected with them, and if they want to raise issues, to be here and support them. Um, but, and there will be a number that will be worried about their longer term prospects. There will be a number that will be worried linked to what um, to, to Councillor Robinson's point about how are we going to be able to keep up competitive wages for our, for our staff in terms of the attract, more attractive wages they can get from working in other places. But in relation to care providers on the brink, we haven't got information about any of, any of that at the moment. And we've, we've been very focused in trying to make sure that we, um, we, we, we use the data to respond and we also have the right connections with them to get some early warning from them. I, I'm, just, I'm probably more concerned at the moment actually around some home care providers where you've got some of those issues around wages, but you've also got the exacerbation of travel costs. So um, Councillor Robinson's put a bit of a prompt in about that, but also needing to make sure that we look at short-term issues around petrol prices but hopefully they're short-term and then difficulty especially in a large borough like ourselves for for people thinking if i'm putting petrol in my car to get to a care call am i getting am i getting compensation for that can my care provider afford to pay me for that so they, i think the, the care the, the home care issue for us is probably even higher on the list than the care home issue at the moment Um, I think it's pertinent that, that Phil mentioned that whole issue of concern about uh, people delivering care in the community and the rising cost of petrol. But I have to be honest and say that it was, uh, it was Mayor Ros Jones in conversation with me who asked me to, to, to raise that with Phil. So you can be assured that that awareness, that you know, realisation of the pressures on the care sector is appreciated at the very top of, um, of this council. Thank you. Um, am I right in thinking that the council might help then if fuel costs become an issue with people being able to access stuff? So. We're having a look at the moment. Um, in, so we, what we've tried to do is maximise the amount of just fee increase, just in general, we're giving to our care providers going into April. We've also got a cost of care exercise to do with home care and care home providers that's been mandated by 
central government that needs to report in by September. So they need to look at what, where that lands. But we're specifically looking at whether there's any um, one-off funding that we can find that's available, bearing in mind that those monies are more and more threatened in the council as a whole, to see whether we can do something to support around fuel costs. It's a relief to see that they're starting to come down and some some kind of signs of, of kind of relief there but we're certainly working with the sector to see what's needed thank you um one of the concerns i have is around the strain placed on the council due to increased referrals of domestic abuse which is good that there are more referrals so more reporting but um i was Wondering what is behind this and how are we coping with the demand? Just going pre-pandemic for a second, one of the things that the council very deliberately did at the back end of 2019 was um, campaign about domestic abuse in a way that was designed to raise awareness um, and also kind of link that. There was an event held in a... Um, Kind of central Doncaster location, kind of link that with increasing professional curiosity of people working in Doncaster about feeling confident to report domestic abuse, but also connect that with a hub that would do something about domestic abuse when it was reported. So our active aspiration at that point in time was to increase reporting. So it's worth us having that sort of perspective that um, actually, I mean, I'd only just got to Doncaster at that point, it was good that to come into an authority that was brave enough to say we're not going to pretend it's less of a problem than it is we're going so we're going to almost adopt a zero tolerance approach we're going to make sure that people feel confident in reporting it the pandemic itself has exacerbated that for reasons that people will be aware of people cooped up in in in, in, in challenging kind of situations the council's campaign around domestic abuse has continued and has become kind of COVID specific as well. So when we talk about staying at home, for example, or through those kind of phases, we were really clear to caveat that around making sure that people who felt at risk of domestic abuse knew that that, you know, that wasn't the safest option for them and that routes to support would be available to them. We've also invested in our domestic abuse capacity. So there was definitely a period of time you lose track of time actually don't you with all these things going on definitely a period of time 2020 start 2021 we really started to be quite worried about the ability of our domestic abuse hub to keep up with the rate of of referrals um, both through kind of council funding and also through one-off covid funding that's been been made available and we've made the most of we've we've increased the amount of capacity we've got within our um within our domestic abuse services to respond. So um, again, I'm not gonna present the, the, the picture that it's effortless and easy working in domestic abuse in Doncaster because they're working flat out all the time. And obviously the, the, the people that they're working with are very, in very challenging and traumatizing situations. But the council has invested in the support that we provide at the front line for that. Thank you. You did say that you got a one-off uh, pay, payment for because of COVID and um, does that end soon then and um, will there be uh, fulfillment in in that gap or not we've we've rolled some of that funding forward the, the issue with domestic abuse has always been though that there are so many one-off or different funding streams um, and some of our we've got some good response from partners on domestic abuse but and we've also set up actually a chief officer group on domestic abuse to get more kind of senior grip across our partnership on this. But there's, there's often an issue with, I guess, people putting their money where their mouth is and making sure we've got recurrent support in Doncaster around domestic abuse. So I can't give the impression that we're, we're safe for the foreseeable future and every financial issue has been sorted. But we have used COVID monies, one-off monies, and we're skilled at attracting monies as well from central government and other sources. We've used them to keep our services sustainable at the moment. Thank you. Um, uh, in the report, talk about uh, direct action payment groups. Um, where is this at and what are the group's aims and um, 
What is a direct action payment group? I think I'm going to need to do some work on that, Councillor Smith, because I'm not sure what that's referring to, to be, to be blunt. I haven't had time before now to do, the, to do the work on it. So I'm wondering whether it means a direct payment action group or whether I've just worked, I've, so I need, to, I need to do a bit of work with colleagues and then I maybe can provide a written response if that's okay. I think it was just direct payment group being set up. It was mentioned within the, in the text. And so my question was really was where is it at and what are the aims of the group? I think if, now you've clarified I thought it might be about direct payments but I didn't want to come in with some direct payments feedback and then it was about something else so if, can I just do some work it sounds quite interesting doesn't it well, direct action is always nice but um, if, I can, if I can do a bit of work and then provide a written submission to scrutiny does that feel okay Chair is it okay if I ask the cabinet member um, what your sort of views are on a direct payments and do you know anything about a direct payment group um, I have to confess, I don't know anything about the group. In relation to direct payments, I always remember how keen you were, Chair, at asking how many people are taking up these payments and what is their personal experience of, of having that budget? How able are they to secure the help that they want through that, through that mechanism? Um, Above and beyond that, I can't comment any further, but it's just suffice to say that I have that level of understanding of it and, and you know, when, when the matter is raised, um, do, do keep that in focus. Thank you. Um, actually, I think I quite like the idea of calling it direct action. Just having recently watched the programme about the 1995 Disability Action Network and the changes they made to law, um, I would actually say that direct payment support groups have existed in the past. It's, if, it, if it's being set up, it's nothing new. So I would be very interested to know where exactly it's at and what its aims are. Excuse me, Chair. Uh, just checking the report. It is um, referred to as a direct payment action group. Oh, okay. um, thank you for answering all the questions. And I'll just sort of just go back a little if I can go back briefly we're talking about people waiting for assessments and can you tell me a bit about where the well where the well-being service is at the moment are people who are referred for an assessment do they get a visit from a well-being officer the well-being service is for people that don't know is kind of broadly outside adult social care and is run within the kind of communities directorate the, the problem with the communities directorate is its strength in a way because it, its flexibility makes it all things to all people. So um, the recent challenge with the wellbeing services is they, because they're, they're very well led, very well led, very almost, I say entrepreneurial, but you know, in the, in the right sense of that word. So they've said, you've got some access issues in adult social care, we'll step up, we'll provide some support around wellbeing um, and actually, um, within communities because of the flexibility of the way that stronger communities teams work they also as well as the well-being team have stronger communities colleagues who will take what they call single strand work so they're not precious in other words they're like, okay if I can help with that I'll help with it but what they've now got they, they've you know they've they've done some really good work with individuals that are waiting but what they've now got is their own waiting list because the finite number of people in that service, however good they are, can't expand to deal with all the demands that they've got. So this is why I think the really important thing to emphasise is the underlying issue with the adult social care front door demand is the nature of the way that demand is managed. Just trying to get other people to pick up work is, 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 it does not deal with the underlying issues. So well-being, the wellbeing team will have a future role in, that, in adult social care and that kind of prevention just like they've got an underlying role with um, early help in relation to children's services. But it's really important that we don't just think, where can, where can I farm this referral off to or I'll give it to wellbeing? We have to do more to just make sure that actually we, we reduce the handoffs in the first place. So there's quite a lot to get into in that space, but I think for us the fundamental thing is we've got to change our approach to access for adult social care rather than just think about who we can pass referrals on to. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting area to look at, actually, because you can end up with people being referred on, referred on, will you be able to support this person? 
You know, if somebody actually literally physically can't get out of the house, um, it's not much point pointing them in the direction of social groups and things and what they might be interested in if they actually need a personal assistant to help them get out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, has anybody got any more questions while we're on this area? Okay, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Um, we will sort of move on a bit faster now, hopefully, and we'll move on to regeneration and environment. Um, and we've got some questions, I think, kicking off with, um, well, just looking at this, we haven't got Councillor Khan or Councillor Nevitt here. Um, so actually, I'll move on to question two, Councillor Healy. I knew that was coming, Chair. Right. Well, we've got approximately 111 million being spent on capital projects, utilising both public and private finance. I'm curious to know how much does the Donc does Doncaster gain in residual finance? Thank you, Councillor. Um, so to answer the point about what do we gain, I, I, I can't give an overall metric for that for that 111 million. I think it's fair to say because um, some of those are in the are, are at the point of conception, some of those are are, are are further on, and some of them will be at the point of delivery. In terms of gain, if we look at gross value added, you're talking about you know the amount of spending power people have got to the expenditure, the income, so in effect what people earn, and then the the amount of goods and services that are made or sold or delivered in an area. General principle of the public sector investment for regeneration and economic development is one job per 15,000. That's the kind of metric used um, at combined authority level. So that gives you some idea as to where 111 million could go, but that's not all about regen and jobs because some of this is in relation to, is in relation to transport, um, and, and also in relation to skills. Um, what I would say is, is those schemes, each of those that we have secured additional or external funding for, will require metrics. Some of them will require different metrics, so some of them will be jobs. Some of them might be in relation to things like active travel. Um, they may be in relation to modal shift and how people move move about. So I can't give you an overall figure. What I would say is that the, the I think there's an opportunity to look at the impact of some of these schemes on a more granular or individual basis. So what is the outcome of LUF, so the, the, the money that we've got in relation to the market, in relation to um, Copley and, and the library, and in relation to St James's Bath, and also um, the money that we've got in relation to the remediation of the waterside um, potential hospital location. But I can't give you a, a, a ballpark figure of how 111 million will equate to in terms of gain. Thank you. Um, tell me, have we got any sort of good, really good examples about maximising investment in Doncaster, national funding coming in? Two town deals, what, 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 one LUF, potentially an LUF, an LUF2, um, a significant proportion within the um, city region sustainable city region transport scheme um, to the tune of um, I think Doncaster's a, a portion of that. Sorry, L LUF. Oh, sorry, uh, leveling the government's leveling up fund. So, um, and we got two town deals, and not everybody got one town deal. And we we got we got two, and we were in the first round of LUF. And as you know, some people weren't weren't successful in LUF. We've got a very successful bid in for the rail HQ aligned to our town deal because the town deal provides for the new, a new office development right next to the station, which is what government are indicating they want as part of re relocating between two to 400 of those civil servants that run, uh, that run um, the, the rail HQ currently. Um, we've also got significant uh, money through active travel. It's a 15 million pounds worth of active travel for cycle lanes. And then we've got significant investment for transforming cities fund. Um, this is all good, but it presents us, and one of the points I wanted to come to, it does present us with a little bit of a challenge because the reality is market prices are increasing, timescales are getting longer because you can't get the people to do to do the work, but the clock's ticking on the spend. So it's a bit of a, uh, it's a positive problem to have, I think it's fair to say, but it does present us with a bit of a challenge. The other point I'd like to raise, Chair, as well, is we are getting an additional 3.5 million 
um, of money from the Sheffield City region, and that's revenue gain share, um, and that will be for project feasibility funding. Um, so that's two years of, in effect, two years of gain share that's accessible reasonably quickly. Um, there's a further £26 million pounds worth across South Yorkshire of gain share capital, which, which can be split between the authorities. Um, that also provides an opportunity of up to additional £40 million of borrowing, in line with the regulations that the combined authority can gain. And then um, going forward, because if you remember the clock was ticking on gain share from when the deal was signed in 2015, but the gain share wasn't released because of the issue of who was in the combined authority, who wasn't in the combined authority, and whether or not it was going to be wider than Yorkshire. So the money for gain share only came on stream slightly later um, and after the mayoral election. So there's some money in the pot that can be used immediately. For the remaining 26 years of gain share, on a pro rata basis, Doncaster would get 17.7 or around about 18% of that, given its population and size. So that equates to, over 26 years, because obviously it's 30 million a year for South Yorkshire, 83 million pounds worth of capital and 55 million pounds worth of revenue. Um, if I was to speak out loud, I'd say, well, just give it us. Yeah, that would be nice, but quite often it's not just given to us. There are various necessary um, hoops to go through for due diligence, but that gives you some idea of the funding that's available. Of course, that is subject to gain share always being there. And of course, that's a third, well, it's a remaining 26 years of commitment from a government that made it that commitment um, back in 2005. So I think it's fair to say we are attracting funding. We are getting noticed. We are getting investment. We get a lot of interest. One of the challenges we get as well, though, is we get interest from companies who perhaps are more in their infancy, particularly in innovative areas of technology, particularly around green tech. So quite often we have a bit of a challenge because they will want to take on premises, but yet won't necessarily have the strength of covenant. And that's the question is, do we, do we then as an authority make a judgment as to, as, as to what, how much or how little support we would give? Um, in terms of taking some of that risk. So I think it's fair to say we are on a positive curve. Um, the challenge, I think, will be in, in, in delivery going forward with a lot of that cash that's coming in. Councillor Canning, I do realise you've got a question about fly tipping. I'll just sort of carry on with this bit. Can you tell me some about something about the issues we have around recruitment and availability of appropriate skills? And I think you've, you've touched on that to some extent. Um, you know, physical buildings, physical infrastructure is extremely important. It's the people that are the most important. Yes, thank you, Chair. So I can talk about that from two angles. Externally, I think it's fair to say that there's been various impacts, um, to greater or lesser degree, on, on various sectors of the market. Um, so the hospitality and care sector certainly took a hit under under COVID um, in, terms of, in terms of recruitment. Interestingly, in Doncaster, there's more demand than supply for higher skilled jobs. So that's level four, so that's higher certificate of education. Um, and more supply than demand for middle and low skilled workers, which is probably kind of what you'd, what you'd expect. So a real trick in that money that's coming in is to provide those better paid, those better paid jobs and get those people who are currently in the, um, at the lower skilled where there is a, a, a demand outstripping supply into the ones that are higher skilled where there is supply outstripping um, demand. Um, internally, I think we, as a, as a directorate, we have a, a, a bit of a ticking time bomb issue in terms of skills. So I've got an aging workforce that does physical work still, you know, so we have a lot of people who do physical work. And if you look at the sickness elements within, within e and &E, COVID, um, COVID is, is, is significantly less in terms of in terms of sickness. COVID equates 623 days across 135 occasions up a quarter three. But actually, and when you compare that to musculoskeletal, there's more. So that gives you some idea. And also, actually, worryingly, stress, depression, anxiety um, equates to significantly more than COVID-related um, sickness. Our overall sickness in E&E is 10.92 in comparison to 11.4 corporately. Without COVID, it's 10.21. Days, which is still above, above the target, but perhaps not bad given, given, given where we've been. And so we've got real challenges internally with an ageing workforce doing physical work. We've also got an ageing workforce with people with an awful lot of technical specialism, highways, environmental health, you know, and others who will, who will go and will go with an awful lot of corporate memory. 
So we've got to start thinking, and we are starting to think about how we do that workforce uh, future planning. Um, in terms of recruitment internally, I think local authorities work very traditionally in some respects, in some respects, in its approach to human resource rather than human relations. So pay is an issue, I'll be honest with you, because I have people who can go to other places, flood engineers who can go to other places for a similar job, but get more money. And I can't kind of walk down the corridor and say, well, let's pay them three grand more because I have a structured process to go through for pay and grade in relation to job evaluation. So sometimes the agility is a bit restricted in terms of what I can offer people. I can offer people training, I can offer people development, but the reality is if it's, if it's pay, which is predominantly what people look at in terms of recruitment um, in the first instance, then that is a bit of a, a, bit of a struggle for me. And I have got some key players, in, in, particularly in the environment side of e and &E, who are of a particular age, who won't be with this authority within two to three years, probably. And I need to start thinking about that, that, succession, that succession plan. So that is a bit of a challenge for us. But I also think we need to look at pay and grading. Um, and we're looking at that as part of the street scene review as well, and working patterns. Because as you know, street scene has a four on, four off pattern, one depot um, across an area which is nearly 50% of South Yorkshire. So I do think we need to be less traditionalist down in our approach to some of the pay and grading issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's maybe something we might come back to in the future. Thank you. Um, Councillor Canning, you've got a question. Yeah, um, improvements in fly tipping. What have we learned from the improvements that have been made? So, 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 so what I've learned and what we've learned, um, I think are quite similar. Um, step back and assess the reasons as to why it's happening and the reasons why you're not meeting the standards. So there are a number of factors within fly tipping. Um, there was people's behaviours, there were conditions that were enabling it, there was a level of resources that the council had to enforce or collect. When I started it almost it was like a tsunami of, of fly tipping. You know, it was it was rife. We had over three thousand cases of backlog. We were way below the 65% target for, for, for clearing it up once it's reported within seven calendar days. We're now at 95% and we have no backlog. What I learn is, is that resources need to match your aspiration or your level of acceptance, I think it's fair to say. So we put additional money in there. Um, and I'm not just saying you chuck money at something, but, but the reality is um, uh, street scene as a service um, has lost due to resource constraints, not from this authority, because it's not a choice, but actually through central, I would argue through, through you know, a, a continuance of reduction of funding for local government, has lost 100 posts in about the last five to 10 years. That equates to four award. So that gives you some idea of, of, of the gap we've had to fill. So what we've learned is step back, assess, um, think about the level of resources, be a little bit more intelligence led as well. So be a bit more, not proactive, but predictive. And the bins are quite a good example of that. So routinely emptying a park bin, because you routinely empty a park bin, probably not the best use of resources. Empty it when you know it's going to be full, rather than turn up and find it's overflowing or turn up that it's, that it, that it, that it, that it's not. And then closer working as well between street scene and enforcement. You know, the report indicates some of the FPNs were issued. So the FPNs for litter, but then the FPNs for fly tipping, and then actually prosecutions that have led to, to more significant court-related fines. So um, that's, what, uh, that's what we've learned, I think, as a service. Um, I think what I've learned as well as the director is to actually listen to some of the people who are providing the service at the front line as well, you know, and learn from them. Yeah. Do we have any uh, other good news stories then to spread? Um, if you'd seen the Twitter release last week, there was me, a cabinet member, and a Womble doing a litter pick. Um, yeah, I did offer to be the Womble, um, but they wouldn't accept it. Um, we won Keep Britain Tidy Spring Clean. We were a national winner, um, which is some feat to say where we were with fly to pin some time ago. Um, we've got significant capital funding to improve lake edgings at Sandal Park and Asken. Lake, we've had some, we've got new play equipment and that's been installed at Sandal B um, to replace the stuff that burnt down. We're going to host the Green Flag uh, 2022 um, awards and also, uh, you know, a thank you politically, we've had an additional £600,000 worth of capital equipment in the budget for street scene 
an additional 200,000 for the tree team. Going back to the point you said about learning, when I first started we had tree issues, it's fair to say, in, in a particular place. Um, we in effect had one tree expert who worked four days a week and we were charged with planting a million trees over a prescribed time as a mayoral commitment. So that's what we have learned is kind of match your resources to your aspirations but do that uh, carefully and with the relevant due diligence. So good news generally. I think the, the, the services are demonstrating in some areas a, a, a tighter organisational grip um, but we've still got some way to go I think. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move on to children and young people next Antoinette. We, I know you've got some questions. Did you want to ask one very briefly about... <laughs> It's just a brief one, really, because you mentioned your concerns about growing your own and, and the difficulty you've got in recruiting um, people with technical qualifications and that experience because you'd be losing lots. Do you engage in like a train, a paid to train, stroke, grow your own graduate program to kind of support that loss in um, expertise and experience that you're going to have so people can work shadow and be trained before you have a mass loss of this um, knowledge and skills? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, I didn't want to scare, unduly scare the horses because we, we have got that. Cause, but, but one of the problems that we've got is that it's fair to say I don't think the grades are necessarily attractive to people to come in and train as a planner or train as an, as, as an EHO. So we need to think about that. But yeah, we've got people coming through the system. Um, the challenge with that is retaining them because if they can say, well, I've trained as a drainage engineer here and I've done three years as a drainage engineer, but Barnsley are going to offer me three grand more for what is in effect the same post, I'm going to go because I've got, you know, I'm at a pit time in my life where I've got commitments, etc., which reflect the need for additional money. So I really do think we need to think about it. But yeah, we've got that in place and we've got career graded posts where people can in effect train as they earn and as they learn. But the bigger challenge, I think, is making sure that we've got that agility to be able to say to somebody, or set the grades at a level which is market competitive rather than what job evaluation may come out with. But yeah, certainly grow your own. I mean, for, for, for the personal level, you know, for me, I, I've worked across seven authorities, so I've moved about. Would I have moved about, perhaps, if I could have had the opportunities within the organisations and that investment and the development? I don't know. But the last thing you want is to grow somebody and then um, lose them. But then, likewise, it benefits the family and sometimes they'll, they'll return. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the children and young people section. And um, I know you've put in some questions, Antoinette. I'll move straight on to you. Thank you. Um, so DSG is predicted to overspend by five, just over five million this year, and it creates a cumulative overspend of 14 million. We know the figures. Um, a lot of it's down to spending the high needs block. Um, you so, talked just, about... just to clarify, that's the dedicated schools grant. Oh, sorry, grant. dedicated yeah, schools okay, grant, yeah. yeah. Um, so the report states senior education leaders are liaising with schools around devolution of elements of this direct schools grant to ensure that the right services are in place to support the children locally. Uh, will these be fully funded now and into the future? And what elements are proposed to be devolved? Thank you very much for the question. So a very, very complicated landscape in terms of high needs block and how funding is distributed or not and what's kept centrally um, and beyond. And it's a piece of work that we started before the pandemic where we really much focused on the high needs block overspend because we were seeing that the trend was um, going in the wrong way. Um, and what we at that point did is we did a piece of work around disaggregating and understanding the high needs block with our school system, because we know that we can't do anything without our school system, and through a collaboration, we will be able to support young people in mainstream school as as long as possible, because that's where we know children achieve better outcomes. So, and and that's the overall aim for everything that we do in the high needs block is to keep our young people within maintained school or mainstream school for as long as possible. And where there are significant needs or where there are educational needs identified, that we address that appropriately. So, as I say, in 2019, we started this work um, around how could we devolve parts of the funding, not all of the funding, to the to local sets of, of schools or groups of schools um, to work together to address uh, children's needs within schools. 
we had we didn't agree on anything then and we still we now need to reassess in the context of the most recent green paper because there's some significant changes proposed in there and as well as working with our school systems to see what parts can be devolved um, other authorities has gone down a route that they have devolved the majority of their funding and got rid of things like the people referral unit um, and other specialist interventions. We don't think that that's necessarily the right approach. And our school system actually um, agrees with us on that. So we are just in the process of picking up that consultation in the light of the green paper and thinking what we do next in terms of what do we devolve to a locality level that provides specialist support to keep young people within mainstream schools. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but that's just where we are at the minute. Thank you for that. Yeah, it is a concern because it's like, what do you devolve that's suitable to be devolved and how do you quality assure that over, over time? Yeah. A uh, second question then is around um, education and healthcare plans issued within 20 weeks. And it says only 38% have been issued within the 20 week standard. Are we on track for a significant improvement in that time scale? So this is a significant worry for us. We've always been one of the highest performers um, locally and regionally and in fact nationally. Unfortunately, I, I just want to provide a bit of context of what we are seeing at the minute. So, um, and I talked about that perfect storm before. So um, what we are seeing at the minute in terms of children with special educational needs, so that includes SEN support as well as uh, education, health and care plan. We've gone from 2017 having 6,244 children in that cohort we are now standing at 7,418. So we've seen an 18.4% increase in those three years around children that are presenting with need. In terms of statutory education, health and care plans, in 16-17, we had 238 referrals in that year. In 2020-21, we have seen 440. That's an 84% increase. So. Obviously, with those number of referrals, we need to then do the um, assessment and then that um, and around 60% of those children, and young people then move on to education and health care plan. So that's a context that we are working within and we are we are maintaining uh, around two and a half to three thousand uh, education, health and care plans at the minute. So significant demand and significant pressures on that team. Um, we, you will see that our uh, performance is improving and we're anticipating that it will improve even more so. So quarter, th quarter four, we'll see about 50% um, of EHGPs being completed within timescale, but then quarter one will be even better. Um, we have bolstered the team with additional capacity, but again, it's really, really hard to recruit SEND officers. So the dilemma that we constantly have around capacity and demand um, remains a real issue for us, but we are acutely aware of that and doing everything we can to address it. Thank you for that. Is there a pattern to the increased numbers? Because they're quite significant now. Is it COVID related or are there other issues that are coming forward? So in terms of the issues that are coming forward, we're seeing a significant increase in, and we have seen even before COVID, but it's accelerated at the minute is uh, requests for special educational, um, uh, social, emotional, mental health. Um, so our young people presenting with significant social, emotional, mental health problems and being unable to regulate their behaviour, for example. And what we are also saying, because, because of the increase in the numbers of EHCPs, there's also then an increase in the demand on special school placements. And our special schools are, are running at full capacity at the minute and a little bit over. So we are working uh, closely with South Yorkshire region to see if there's any provisions that we collectively can actually develop and support. Um, and locally, we're thinking very hard around team around school type of functions um, to really support our schools. The main issue is, is to equip our mainstream schools to support these young people within the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are kind of focusing our, um, our attention at the minute. I, I do think though that the green paper will provide us with some um, a different lens uh, on how we deal with children with special educational needs. And there's acknowledgement in the Green Paper that actually the reforms that was brought in in 2014 didn't work. Um, so there's a lot of work that I think that's going to fall out of that. And actually a real sense, for the first time I get a sense from the Department of Education that they really want to work collaboratively 
with local authorities in the space. Um, and we've been identified and in working collaboratively with the with the DFE around finding specific solutions locally to the pressures that we are facing. Thank you for that, and that's really good news. <laughs> Um, finally, um, the figure shows that those helped into work um, is 4.7, and this is a genuine question because I just don't know, is um, helped into work shows 4.73% with a target of 6.7%, and it's shown as red. How are we working towards increasing the percentage to achieve the target, and is a target of 6.7% appropriate and comparable? That's people with learning disabilities. Yeah, people yeah. with learning disabilities. I think that's a me one. So um, we've had a, um, I suppose a technical point to make because we've changed um, what we're reporting on this because we've changed our computer IT systems. Um, previously, we were over-reporting how many people were helping into employment without really being aware of that. So we were, to, we, we were counting people we were supporting into volunteering as well as people we were supporting into paid employment which gave us, I think, an, an inflated sense of how well we were doing. So there's the latest stats we've got, although there's going to be a little bit of a check before we submit, because there's a, a national return that we do on this. We're going to check it. It's probably more of a realistic sense of where we are. Um, we've got a range of things that we're working on to increase the number of people with disability we bring into employment. So we've got... Uh, um, Sort of addict community enterprise kind of horticultural college where we're, we're expanding capacity to be to enable to support people and more people through that route we're also doing a, 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 a kind of an access to work i say course for people to learn disability just to help them build the confidence and use their life skills and we're continuing to use direct payments as well so a good example of direct payments to for example we've used them to help people with cv writing um, access to training and so on. In terms of your question about the target, I think the target is unrealistic. I think so. so the national average is 5.1% at the moment. We're at 4.7. We'd be better off, especially in the difficult circumstances. Though I took, took Dan's point on board about about the distribution of job opportunities, but we'd be better off, I think, thinking let's make sure we're not below the national average in Doncaster and then build from there. So I think I wouldn't want to tell you that we had a, a strong set of plans that will get us to a level that's well above the national average, well above the regional average also. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we, we do need to move on. So we need to just agree the recommendations. Paragraph 12, page 3. Are we in agreement? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we now moved on to the uh, Children's Trust. Um, hello, <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself, Andy? Hi, Chair. My name is Andy Hood. I'm Head of Young People's Services and Innovation for Doncaster Children's Services Trust. Thank you. And Antoinette, you've got some questions again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so despite progress, to, um, despite progress, significant changes remain in relation to the transition to mosaic system. Um, how well are these issues being addressed and what are the major risks to progress and what mitigations are in place to ensure that any challenges are overcome in terms of rolling forward to the future? Thank you, Councillor.
Thank you for that. So do you feel that Mosaic is a system to pursue, given the fact there's a lot of workarounds being created? And is there a concern that um, departments running two systems of knowledge keeping might become an issue because it's like, you know, where does the knowledge get held in one place or the other or both? And sometimes that means that mistakes are made. Can I Sorry, on, off, on, off. I thought I would take that on behalf of the Tr Children's Trust and the Council because it's both our organisations that are involved with the transition to Mosaic. The decision was taken to use Mosaic as a, a case management system two or three or four years ago already. And at that point in time, which is still relevant now, is to have a single case management system for adults and children. The transition to that has been a little bit bumpy and lumpy and all of those kind of things. And adults are further um, advanced in the transition to Mosaic than what we ourselves are. We still do believe that Mosaic will provide us their appropriate capability once we overcome all the teething issues, I would call it, um, in terms of, of the transition for us and for adults. Our main concern at the moment is that we are unable to report effectively around performance uh, through the system. That is based on uh, data quality that needs to improve, so input of workers into the system, and that is not just a trust issue, it's, a, it's across the council and the trust, it's more uh, acute within the children's trust because of the safeguarding element and because of the significant amount of reporting that that uh, part of the system needs to do. So d uh, data quality input is a key issue for us. There is also then some tweaks, as Andy referred to, around the forms not helping us to do our work really effectively. Um, and we are ac actively working with the Mosaic to amend those forms and to make the pathways or the, um, the, the workflows work appropriately within the system. And then the third part is there's a big improvement push around reporting, making sure that we've got the right reports written because you have to build them very, very technical. I'm, I'm, can you see? I know exactly what the technical terms is. But those reports need to be built in order to pull the information through from what social workers are inputting into uh, appropriate performance management information. To give you some assurances, though, we are managing the risk through local workarounds at the minute. There is, um, and, and uh, Ofsted saw that when they came in at their most recent visit. So I can give you some assurances around that. Of course, it's not 100% assurance that we know everything about everything that a performance system should have given us. However, we will never know everything about everything, do we? So we are doing the best that we can. We've got a rapid improvement program in place for this, and we've got a governance that sits very strongly around that, which includes not only Children's Trust colleagues, but includes council colleagues, and is co-chaired by Debbie Hogg, um, our Director of Resources, that's the overall sponsor for the implementation, and myself and other colleagues. So we are absolutely focused on this to get this right, because we can't continue to be short-sighted or long-sighted, or whatever you want to call it, because we're not completely blind, but we can't continue with what we've got currently, and we need to put it right immediately. Do you have a time scale on that, approx? Yesterday. So, ASAP, I would hope that we are in a much better position for quarter, uh, quarter one reporting. Quarter four reporting is going to still be very, very tricky because we're still within you know, we're, st we're still managing uh, the difficulties that we have. But hopefully by quarter one, we will be definitely in a better position. Thank you, that's good news. Just, can I, uh, just ask actually, if you don't yeah. mind, Antoinette, um, is this exacerbated by people working remotely? As in, you just can't talk to the person next to you on the desk and say, how on earth do I do this sort of thing? Again, on, off, on, off. I, th I think, I think what that's absolutely one of the reasons. I think the demands that are currently on our social work capacity is immense. So if you think if you, if you are a social worker, you have to deal with 25 cases, quite complex, difficult, safeguarding cases, as well as trying to navigate your world around a new system, as well as not sitting next to each other necessarily to do that absolutely impacts on, on us, the ability to implement the, this quicker. That is not the only thing, though, that we need to fix. So report writing, we do need to fix. What I would say, though, is very recently, 
We have got floor walking, virtual floor walking and physical floor working where there is a dedicated worker that are um, that goes out and sits with teams and help them support. Andy, I don't know if you want to add a little bit more around that in particular. Thank you. Antoinette, do you want to carry on? Yeah, final question then. Um, placements, um, there's a two point, well, just over two million overspend on placements, and I know they are expensive, um, and that's for children in care, 16 plus. Um, but there's an increase of like nearly half a million since quarter two, which is significant. Um, there's 18 expensive placements uh, reported, costing from 2,185 a week through to 9,758, which is massive and might be appropriate, but are these being reviewed at the higher cost end? Um, what's the difference in cost between in-house and um, out-of-borough placements? And what time scale is it to move these high cost placements to good quality, but less high cost?
Yeah. So just to add a little bit of context as well, so Andy's given a really good account of what we're trying to do locally. I think it's really important to note that the demand that, that we are facing. So again, we are in national crisis. Um, looked after children has gone up in locally by 150. Is that 150? Um, 150 looked after children. That means those are children need that cannot live at home, and therefore we have to place them either in foster care or residential care. So when we did the future placement strategy, it was based on the demand in 2019, and as I say, that significantly increased. So it's significant pressure. The other unusual thing that is happening is more young people are coming into care. So coming into late care, and that's why you see 16 plus placements. Um, that are really expensive because it's unusual so and the complexity of those children are significant and therefore that's why we why, that's why we're dealing with what we are dealing with thank you for that i think it's a positive picture because you know for all the reasons you said doncaster children in doncaster better quality care and the, the financial savings as well all make sense and i suppose a greater recruitment for foster carers if there are more children who are having to go into care Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your answers. I uh, just uh, quickly need to agree the recommendations on page 67. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to St. Ledger Homes. Um, and I'll just take the first question. Um, it's about, again, the impact of COVID and sort of uh, what it's seen, what the, the effect it's having on staff sickness. And also if there's an impact on your residents that's been particularly noticed, certain cohorts of your residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, today we have 12 people that are reporting as uh, having COVID. Um, forgetting about Christmas, where we saw a spike, um, the previous highest incidence of COVID during the pandemic was 15. So we're not far off that, actually. Um, that said, most of the people that are office based that do have COVID carry on working and are able to work to some degree. We've had one or two instances where people have been quite seriously ill recently, but, but generally they've been managed to work. The main impact is obviously in respect of our trade staff that can't carry on working um, and we can't redeploy them. So, so there's been some impact there. Um, it's obviously having an impact in terms of our repairs delivery. Um, but I don't want to overstate that because the figures are not massively high when you, you look at the overall numbers. Um, there's obviously some issues in terms of supply chains and materials and things like that because other organisations have the same thing and we have contractors that work for us that deal with the same sort of pressures. Um, in terms of customers, um, we have had some instances of refusals for, for access, etc. obviously. Uh, we had some issues where we were chasing down outstanding electrical inspections and one or two people uh, really tried to avoid us going into the property because of anxieties around that. So, so that was a, an issue, but a, but, a, but a relatively isolated issue. Um, the main issue in terms of customers has been um, almost like a, a delay issue in the sense that um, when we had the main lockdowns, customers didn't want to see us, not surprisingly. So nobody reported repairs. So, you know, I, we, we got buses organised and sent our plumbers to the beach for the day. No, we didn't. Uh, you know, so, but they were really sort of a, uh, quite a, a drop off on the demand. Um, but post the lockdowns, that's come back with a vengeance. So we've seen something like a 20% rise in demand for repairs activity over the last six to eight months uh, and that's not relented we thought we might have had that for a few months but it stayed high consistently so um, I can't talk obviously about the, the, the prevalence of COVID within our customer base but in terms of what's it meant for the business it's meant that we've had this sort of strange 
uh, demand pattern where it dropped off a cliff and then then absolutely shot through the roof. So that's what I'd say. Thank you very much for that. Um, just sort of carrying on actually with the theme about staff that has been mentioned from other departments. I don't know whether we've asked, asked this question before. Um, how does St. Ledger fare, let St. Ledger fare with uh, attracting and recruiting the right level of staff? Um, well, that's a really interesting question. And um, what we're seeing is that um, the construction trade is in a boom period. So we're seeing uh, it being difficult to attract certain uh, trade staff uh, because they can get significantly higher wages. I mean, I obviously heard what Dan said. It's, it's no different in our business. Uh, they can get significantly higher wages working on a building site at the moment. Uh, some of the rates we're getting to see for things like bricklayers have never been seen before. You know, so 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 there are some real issues there. Um, but it's not just that actually. It feels as though the whole uh, economy is relatively buoyant as well. And, so, and bizarrely, some of the things that we've been struggling to recruit to are things like admin assistants where in the past you might have had 40 or 50 applications. Now we're really struggling to get people to come into administrative jobs. And as an employer, we play, play, pay quite well for those types of roles. It's a good place to work, I would say. Uh, but actually we've really struggled. So, so we're experiencing it right across the board, actually, not just in the, the things that you might imagine. I mean, it, you know, as an example, currently we have vacancies for 11 electricians. So on some of the trades, it's a queue but we're seeing it right across the board. Thank you. That's interesting that it is sort of a, seems to be a, a problem across the council for various issues, various reasons, various departments. Thank you. Um, Councillor Canning, you've got a question. Uh, um, key point indicated to void rent loss. Uh, what is actually happening? Uh, it's been addressed to address this. Um, okay, well, what I would say firstly is I take it to K KPI 1, which is rent loss, uh, and obviously void rent loss is a subset of that. If you see void rent loss, we're actually performing very well. Uh, if you actually look at void rent loss and you compare that with uh, performance uh, mentioned in the BFM report, which was attached to the uh, performance report, so we can compare it nationally, you will see that actually our performance on void rent loss at the end of last financial year, so it's a bit out of date, was actually top quartile. So what we've got going on here is actually we've set in Doncaster an incredibly challenging target around void rent loss. So um, I don't want to just rely on that as, as, as a reason, uh, but you will see that our performance is actually, I would suggest, good. You know, I would say, you know, if we go, I'm, I'm, my, my data is historical because you can't get current data nationally about how everybody else is performing. But if we're prepared to go back to the to March, April uh, of last year, so nearly a year out of date now, actually we're in the top 25% of landlords in the country. Um, that said, there's a lot that we are doing around this. Um, so the issues are uh, twofold. Essentially, within voids, uh, and this is the same answer I'll give to the next question as well because this is exactly the same issue the number of empty properties and the number of rent you get you've lost from those empty properties so uh, but the, the, the issues are twofold firstly how quickly do you repair those properties and turn them around and get them into a state where you can let them and secondly how quickly do you let them so there's a property issue and there's a people issue um, and in terms of what we're doing about that we're, it's, it's a fairly sort of long answer because there's not one smoking gun issue here there's a whole raft of things so on property issues uh, we've been trying to address material supply issues by making sure we've got a solid supply chain that the things that have held us back on certain things so at certain times we've had difficulties accessing plaster fire doors glazing etc etc you know and you know I think we can all understand what the rationale for why that might be an issue in the last two or three years and, and certainly during the pandemic. But, but So we, we're trying to deal with issues like that. We've got our suppliers that, in some instances, hold back materials for us and, and treat us quite well, but it, but it is an issue. Um, we've had issues around staff 
uh, vacancies and staff sickness, etc. So we team and ladle between the different teams to do that. Uh, we've had issues around our letting staff working from home and we actually brought the letting staff back into the office and sat them very right next to the void staff so that there's no opportunity for dropping between cup and lip, you know, that they're actually working together and they're coordinating very clearly. Uh, I meet with the voids manager and the lettings manager on a fortnightly basis and go through everything uh, and chase up the, the ones that we've got. Um, we've done further work to make sure the data is as accurate as we can. I mean, I, when I came um, a quarter ago, I said we'd ironed out some data issues. So, for example, on uh, void periods, the, the day the keys came in was counted as day two not day one for some historical reasons. So we just changed that and we saved ourselves a day overnight. That would always be reported historically, some bizarre things like that. Um, in terms of the properties, we are trying to uh, assess them before they become void if people give us notice. We do viewings whilst they're void. So we get the joiners or plumbers or whatever to come out for a couple of hours while we let people go out. The other thing I should say is that somewhere in the region, and it varies all the time, but somewhere in the region of about 50 to 75% of the voids that we have at any one time are actually let. They're just waiting to be either uh, fully repaired or they're waiting for the tenant to get themselves in a position where they can move. So, um, you know, if you, if you look at Doncaster News today on, on the press, you'll see that, um, referring back to previous comments by the, the mayor at Cabinet, there's an issue about the mayor making the point about every property is a property that somebody can't be in, and that's obviously right, but it's actually not a property without somebody's name against it. They're pre-allocated, um, so people know where they're going. Um, we've looked at the reasons for refusal, why people turn us down. It's a really big issue, and I can take you to stats from this last week where we've had one property refused 13 times uh, before we've let it, and we'll, we'll look at one, what that's about. And we've been out consulting, I don't know if any of you have been involved, but we're consulting on the new allocations policy and what we should do about that. And actually we're trying to clamp down on that. So in some instances we do get people that are serial refusers that go around and constant refuse and we're looking at restricting their ability to do that and perhaps giving them uh, a, an offer on two occasions. But if they turn two down and they're reasonable offers, that actually we might freeze their application for six months because it's just delaying other people getting into those properties. So we're looking at things like that. Um, one of the other issues, and I've, and I've just got the stats up this morning, that we have is around accessible housing register issues. So there's, there's been some interesting changes during the pandemic in terms of the types of property that have come up for letting, uh, that have been vacated. And basically what we've seen is we've seen a significant fall in houses becoming available but the numbers of bungalows, for obvious reasons, stay fairly static. And the obvious reasons are obviously to do with why people leave bungalows. Um, so where people have a choice, they've actually been holding onto the properties in the last two years, not moving. So, so there's, there's been a change in the dynamic. Bungalows have held up, houses have dropped. And what that's meant is proportionately more bungalows. And of those bungalows, a very high proportion of them are adapted in some way. And as a result, we send them over to the accessible housing register people and they look at who's on the accessible housing register list and assess them for it but actually that process takes a really long time largely to do with the availability or lack of occupational therapists and their ability to see so I've got every property that has been longer than 10 days with the lettings team to let in the last week I've got it in front of me and something like 85% of those are ones where there's an accessible housing register issue and they're taking anywhere between 15 and 40 days. So I'm not, proportionately, that's a higher proportion than we've ever had before. So there's a whole raft of issues underpinning that. We've got a review of the accessible housing register process as well ongoing. Um, so I hope that's a relatively comprehensive answer. It's, a, it's not one smoking gun, it's a whole raft of issues that all need to deal with. Can I just ask a question? Um, is the, the, the issue with the occupational therapists and the accessible housing, is that an, somebody who needs to do an assessment on an individual basis? 
it not, it's not just a case of saying this house is accessible. Um, you know, like no, that's exactly it. That's exactly the point. So it's actually when we send them over, the bungalows over to the accessible housing registry, it's looking down at whether or not Mrs Brown's disabilities are adequately dealt with within that property. So it's an individual assessment undertaken by an OT. It's just an interesting area. I just uh, wonder if a house could sort of have an access audit so it is accessible to a wide range of disabilities and therefore it takes a step out. It's just a thought, thinking about it. It's maybe something to look at. Thank you. Got a question from myself, actually. Can you tell me what the homeless preventative work looks like? Yeah, yeah, okay. So currently what we're seeing is a significant uh, increase, something like a fourfold increase in the numbers of people approaching us fearing that they're going to become homeless. And that's been at that level for about the last year or so. Uh, so a massively significant number. However, whilst a lot of people approach us fairly early days when they're just getting into difficulties with their rent and they're worried that their landlord will evict them, etc., uh, a number of people approach us on the day they become homeless. So we have a very significant number of homeless tonight presentations. And as a result of that, the number of staff that we have, which hasn't largely changed, there's been a little bit of tinkering around the edges with grant funding, etc., but the number of staff we have have largely been dealing with those that are presenting as having a problem now or within the next week or so. And the vast number of people that actually approach us 60 to 100 days in advance, we are essentially not, not doing very much with them, giving them very basic advice. And what we have to do is, we, if we're going to get out of this position, is find a way of getting out of that, just de that issue around just dealing with the immediate crisis and get back upstream to actually prevent um, homelessness. And when we, when we get involved with that, we have an awful lot of success. Uh, so, for example, um, we've recently started to undertake work out of hours. Previously, if people approached us homeless out of hours, it was dealt with through ARC, who would have a list of accommodation that we've made available and they would deal with it. We've now put on an out of hours and weekends service where we'll assess those. Uh, and the other weekend, we had 13 people presented as homeless that day. Um, and when they talked to our member of staff and actually we had available hostel provision, um, um, and an emergency bed in that, all of them turned it down. Now, previously, those people would have been assessed by ARC, and the likelihood is, because they wouldn't have done the same sort of assessment as we will, the likelihood is they would have accommodated them to some degree. Then we've got to deal with that issue subsequently. So, so we're trying to ensure that <clears throat> the amount of people coming into the system come in if they really need to, and actually, if there's an alternative, um, we don't, we don't need to. So some of the issues might be about um, young people presenting as having had a problem with their families and um, wanting to um, be accommodated as a result. So we're doing mediation work, actually there and then, at the point of crisis. Uh, we also have somebody last weekend who presented that they'd lost their keys and wanted to accommodate him for the night. You know, just So we get these bizarre sort of things. But the point is, if we can deal with that immediate presenting crisis and get upstream will have much better success. So it's a whole raft of things around, we are looking at how we restructure the team, we're looking at how we work more closely with other services, and bearing in mind homelessness is not actually just a responsibility of St Ledger, so we don't manage the hostels for example, and the churn in the hostels is a critical issue for us to make sure this hostel space is available. Um, we don't manage the support that we give people that are in really severe needs, that's largely done through complex lives. So again, really, really important. But the more we can get upstream, the better. Um, and, and it's things like information, advice and guidance. We need most people to deal with the problems themselves, perhaps with a little bit of support and advice. So we're just looking at commissioning a new database and, and website where we've got up to the minute advice about how to deal with that. Um, we are looking at trying to put more people into that inbox system that we get where people contact us uh, to try and do more mediation either with 
parents, with landlords, etc. We're doing a lot of work trying to look at the private rented sector and what more we can do there to, to uh, address things. I have to say, and it's an issue I want to pick up with Lee actually, we've got, we've got a really pressing problem at the moment around private sector evictions. So over the weekend we had three more families evicted from <coughs> private sector properties. Uh, so, and there's a real fear that at the moment there's a couple of things going on within the private sector. So there's landlords coming out of the lettings game altogether and wanting to capitalise on a buoyant market and sell the property. Uh, but there's also an issue about landlords wanting to carry on renting, but wanting to carry on renting at a much higher level of rent than they currently are getting. And it seems like the, the benefit systems, the local housing allowance, isn't keeping up with that rise. So we need to do a little bit of an analysis about that to understand whether or not that's a real genuine issue or it's just been a few cases that we've had in the last few weeks that have influenced that. Because if, if that is an issue, then the causes of that or the solutions to that <clears throat> are going to be quite difficult for us per, on our own to deal with. We, we need to be really talking to the DWP and it's a national DWP issue about the local benefit rates. So, you know, traditionally Doncaster has always been a very low rental area um, and that's why you see that we've, we've got an awful lot of very low, low level, low quality private rental issues. Um, but DWP obviously pay the rent to that level. You know, so if, if the market is now spiking, we've got a real problem. So really it's about how we work together with the whole homelessness partnership, how we can make sure that we're getting support for those people in the most significant need, um, but that we can free up our home option staff to actually do on, more on that prevention activity. So I don't know if I've answered it well enough, but, but it's a complex no, issue. No, thank you very much for that. Um, what, so uh, obviously St. Ledger is a cog in a, well, as you described, a, a, a sort of um, system there. With the, how, what's the partnership working like between the different, do you think it's good enough? Do you think it could be improved? Do you think there could be a, a sort of like a homeless hub almost of service yeah. providers? Yeah, every, everything can always be improved, can't it? Um, but I've, I've got to say that my sense of it is, and I, and I wish Phil was still here because he obviously manages parts of this, this equation, uh, my sense of it is over the last six to 12 months, it's actually got an awful lot better. There, there have been, and you know, I, I, I don't want to say anything on toward, but there have been tensions between St. Ledger and the council over different bits of it, with staff on the ground pointing fingers at each other, saying, how, is it my job, this is your job, you know, you're not, you know, that sort of petty type of activity. And I think we've really got beyond that. I think we've actually got people really pulling together well, and, and as an example, I would give you um, was the initiative we had just before Christmas where uh, on the Monday of Christmas week, the government came up with some funding and told us they wanted everybody off the streets for Christmas. Now, between my team and um, the Complex Lives team, who did fantastic work, and, and some of the hostels, we made offers to every rough sleeper in, in the borough at that point. Few accepted but 21 people were made offers. Three or four actually came in. The other thing that we had to do during that period was ensure that people were offered vaccinations for COVID and the work that um, um, public health did, working with complex lives and working with us was absolutely superb. And nationally, um, the D D Department for Leveling Up and Housing and Communities have heralded the work that we did actually during that period. You know, incredibly difficult to be dropped on on, on a Monday and said get everybody off the streets by Friday uh, but they all, those offers were made and, and, and that was down to some fantastic partnership working so I, I think it's got an awful lot better actually well, it can always get better but, but I do think it has got better Thank you very much for your answer Sarah you've got a question Thanks Chair Hi Dave um, just building on from uh, Jane's question there about partnership working I did notice on the report about um, antisocial behavior increasing um, and uh, and the cost of that and I know you know since I've been a, a council I don't think I've had one case where antisocial behavior is being resolved in a year and I'm just wondering what if there's a review on how we do partnership working because I do think, St. Ledger's usually in a bit of a hard place because I think the police probably have more of a role in, in that, uh, which I don't really see that often. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question because uh, when we do our annual survey of tenants and residents, um, we ask them specifically about antisocial behaviour. And um, we considered this as a board um, back in September with, with colleagues from the council who came along to our board meeting to actually look at a range of neighbourhood-based issues, antisocial behaviour being one. And from the STAR survey that we do, which goes out to about 3,000 residents, so it's not everybody, but it's, what's that, 15%, um, actually St. Ledger gets really good marks for dealing with antisocial behaviour. Um, and I think why that is, is not anything that we're doing particularly great, if I'm honest, but I'm thinking most of our tenants don't see antisocial behaviour as being a St. Ledger problem. They don't see it as being a St. Ledger responsibility. They either look to the police or they look to the antisocial behaviour services at the council and they give us an easy ride, if I'm honest. That's how I feel about it. Um, so I think it isn't a real issue and it's an issue that's not getting any easier. Um, the, the, um, we obviously track it in terms of complaints that we deal with and we have very high levels of uh, satisfaction with the way that we deal with it. We've also tried to do more to try and keep people aware of what's happening on that because one of the problems we get on antisocial behaviour is they're really difficult nuts to crack. They don't, you don't resolve it overnight so it takes a long time. So, so people that are experiencing antisocial behaviour get really frustrated that they see very little happening. So we've tried to improve our communications back to the complainants to make them aware of what we are actually doing and what action we are actually taking. Obviously within the bounds of confidentiality and what we can share with them. Um, but, it, but it is an issue that is critical on partnership. And I've seen some examples recently where I've actually drilled down into some cases where we've actually had very good partnership working between ourselves and the police and the council. And the localities agenda and the locality situations will make that better. But we already have those uh, NAGs and SIM meetings where these cases are getting discussed in, in great detail. Um, there's some ad hoc issues going on. So um, we've had some particular issues in Denneby uh, where we have actually turned over one of our properties now to the police. They're going to use it as a local drop-in centre. So they've got a local presence on one of the, the areas we've got. So on the ground, actually, I think the partnership working is is pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't I won't blame that as, as a problem of why we've got significant antisocial behaviour in the area. But I've got to say, I mean, Dan was saying he's worked in seven authorities, and I don't know if I can beat that, but, but um, I've certainly been Director of Housing and, and now Chief Exec in three. So, um, and I've never experienced some of the OCG issues that I've seen in Doncaster. Um, you know, and I've you know, I'm, I, I won't work in Kensington and Chelsea. I was working in Rotherham and Hull. You know, they're not they're not known as being the most salubrious, richest towns in the country, but great places that they are. Uh, but you know, really, haven't seen the OCG issues that that the extent of what we've got here. So those are really difficult, intractable issues. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be critical of the partnership working. Far from it. I think it's pretty good. Can I invite you to a meeting? Yeah, by all yeah. means, yeah. Awesome. I'll send you an email. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I think we will draw this to a close. We've been here quite a long time now. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions, and thank you for coming and answering the questions. Uh, we do need to just agree the recommendations on page 90. Are we in agreement? Yeah, we'll be chair. Thank you. Um, I've not actually got the agenda in front of me, but we just actually need to... Just, just need to consider the, the work plan. So, um, can I ask, are there any chairs or panel members who want to uh, particularly highlight something about their work plans coming up? Sarah? Uh, we've got a joint uh, scrutiny coming up soon that's uh, about children's mental health and uh, other uh, children and health uh, issues. And at some point, probably towards the end of the uh, of next of the year is uh, housing which keeps coming up thank you um i know that uh, leanne and councillor hemshaw has got the meeting coming up with head teachers is that right yes. yeah that's in the in the diary and uh, also we've been done the work on commissioning we're, we're going to be talking to partners voluntary sector health that sort of thing and that's in may 
Thank you. So everybody just notes their work plan. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Close the meeting. Thank you.